activity enhancements into your own work as a PWP and what works to improve exercise uptake and adherence, what the evidence tells us. And look at existing research um, and new clinician and patient guides and also future research around exercise uh, for depression. So this is just the brief overview of the evidence base. We're going to talk about uh, uh, depression prevention, uh, depression treatment in adults, older adults, uh, postnatal women, and uh, children and young people. And you will see the latter two areas that Tim and I have done research on, and we will share our findings with you. Over to you, Tim. Yeah, so just sort of building on that, as many of you are probably aware, there is quite a substantial evidence base sort of linking exercise um, and depression, both in terms of depression prevention and treatment. So um, a scoping review that we conducted in 20, uh, well, this year actually, um, found that there's multiple um, randomized controls out there sort of testing exercise in non-clinical populations on symptoms of low mood, et cetera. And um, sort of consistently we're, sh we're finding that exercise does have a, have a drastic impact on, on low mood compared to controls. Also, there's lots of longitudinal research showing generally that if people tend to exercise over a period of time, they're far less likely to become depressed than people who don't exercise over time. And other longitudinal research tends to show that um, if you get two groups of people exercising at a similar rate, um, if, one, so if you stop exercising, you're more likely to develop depression than those that continue. So there is a sort of protective and preventative element to exercise. Um, as sort of highlighted by Patrick there, there's lots of um, research, again, showing that exercise is also helpful in the treatment of depression, um, and that's across the lifespan in various different um, populations, but it's consistent. Um, whether it's children, young people, postnatal depression, older adults, it's consistent and tends to show exercise reduces depression. Some research has shown that it does it to the, um, to the extent and the degree that antidepressant medication works and is comparable to um, psychotherapists such as CBT. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's working. Um, and there are a lot of sort of mechanisms potentially that explain how it might work from different perspectives. So we're going to go through a few of them just now. Um, we're not going to focus up too much on them because we don't have very much time. So it's a bit of a snapshot really. But what we do know is that exercise has the potential to have a direct impact on people's mood and cognitive function. Um, and you, and and here are some of the mechanisms why that might take place. So the one that everyone's probably heard of is in the endorphin response. The idea that sort of a certain amount of exercise can lead to endorphin release um, in somebody's body system. And essentially this sort of, this is argued to give that sense of runner's high, that sense of well-being and elation that might occur with high intensity or moderate intensity exercise. Um, personally, I think this, aspect of exercise is slightly overplayed. I don't know. I've never experienced a runner's high. I don't know. Have you, Patrick? Uh, no, but Tim, you're not running uh, fast enough or uh, with enough intensity to experience it. But the point is very well made. Um, this has almost become a little bit of a myth in terms of yeah. exercise. There is some evidence for it, um, but it's the go-to place when people yeah. are looking at a, a, an explanation for this. And people do talk about experiences, but the, the problem with the endorphin hypothesis, we don't know when the endorphin effect stops because it's not sustained mm -hmm. um, over time. But, uh, but it's there and you will see papers that refer to it. I think we'll talk about it slightly a little bit later on, but it's, it's sl slightly problematic to talk to patients and clients about the endorphin response because essentially what you're setting up is that they will gain a mood boost from exercising, which actually what we know is many people don't get that. Yeah. I've never really got it, a proper mood boost where I felt sort of really happy after exercising. So if we explain it in that way, actually we can set up sort of um, a bit, a bit of false hope maybe and sort of get people to expect something that might not necessarily occur. So it's important to consider that. Yeah, and also often people are exercising in groups and, we, and that could be the mood boost as well. So it's hard to separate out yeah. the, the effect of when you're exercising in a group, you're with people, they're making you feel good, they're making you feel happy. Often they're your friends as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there is some evidence there for the endorphin effect. 
So another sort of biochemical uh, theory is the monoamine hypothesis. So essentially suggesting that exercise works in quite a, in a similar way to antidepressant medications such as SSRIs in the sense of um, increasing the availability of serotonin within synapses. There's um, mostly animal studies, but some research demonstrating that, that occurs um, following certain durations and intensities of exercise might also explain the antidepressant effect of exercise. There's um, a lot of research suggesting that exercise has a direct impact on cortisol release. So the HPA axis, which is sort of like the uh, body's sort of central stress system, if you like, um, we know that's sort of potentially more sensitive in people with depression and cortisol release is um, potentially more sensitive as well. And exercise has quite a complex relationship with it, but in effect essentially down regulates um, the HPA axis and essentially makes it maybe less um, sensitive to cortisol release. Uh, there's some research suggesting it's the increase in body temperature that can have an impact on somebody's mood and well-being. Actually, that it increases sort of physical re relaxation of people's muscles, um, and that can create a sense of calmness and relaxation. A uh, lot of research, and again, um, a lot of, I guess testimony from our clinical practice suggesting this is this next point is really sort of important this idea that actually it refocuses people's attention away from uh, rumination or um, other autonomic symptoms of depression it focuses someone very much on the present moment um, and it's a very powerful way of doing that as we know things sort of mindful practice meditation are very difficult to do whereas physical activity brings someone um, very particularly to the present moment it could be very helpful in that way we also know exercise associated with improved cognitive performance. So there's loads of studies, especially in adolescents, demonstrating that um, when people are physically active, they're more like they sort of um, do better on cognitive tasks. There's associations between physical activity and improved academic performance. Um, and there's loads of psychological sort of studies with adults suggesting that if you do some physical activity, then do a cognitive based task, you do better on it than if you don't. And there's lots of um, theories underpinning that, but one is um, that exercise associated with a specific protein that gets released and this protein has an impact on cognitive performance. But again, this could be very important and useful for people suffering with depression. Uh, but not necessarily something that's maybe talked about very commonly. So alongside sort of direct impact on people's mood, we know that exercise has a direct impact on, on the autonomic symptoms of depression. Um, and really what I'm talking about here is these three specific areas, sleep, fatigue, and appetite. And it could be that it could be argued that it's these three things specifically that maybe exercise, physical activity can do beyond um, other treatment approaches. Um, so for instance, we know exercise or physical activity is associated with improved sleep quality and duration. That's sort of pretty well established. And as um, Marie alluded to in her talk, um, some of this is um, connected with melatonin production and the impact on the sleep-wake cycle. So we know that um, a lot of the time people with depression, the circadian rhythms sort of misaligned and exercise is um, that was research suggesting that exercise is a really good way of sort of realigning that. So um, bringing forward that peak in melatonin that occurs sort of late evening around to midnight. If we exercise earlier in the day or in the early afternoon, that can be brought forward um, and can be reestablished. Also exercise is a good opportunity to get out in the daylight um, and get sunlight into people's retinas, um, as Marie suggested. Again, having an impact on circadian rhythms and resetting um, that natural urge to sleep at set times, which you know is so disturbed in, pe in people with depression often. Um, Patrick, just jump in if there's anything you want to say. I'm, I know I'm hugging everything. Um, just, just jump in. So fatigue and energy, we know that um, exercise has an impact in those areas. We know they're huge problems in depression, very, very common. and sort of general sense is the more energy you use the more you gain yeah lots of research showing that and there's again quite complex reasons as to why that occurs but at a very simplistic level more oxygen more blood to muscles produces and stimulates more energy um, in the mitochondria in people's cells so actually as long as it's done in a gradual non like not too intense sort of way actually it can give people a sense of energy 
which again um, can be quite surprising for people to hear and not necessarily something that you would think of when you think about doing exercise that you would feel more energetic afterwards. We also know exercise can have an impact on appetite in terms of regulating appetite for maybe people who are eating very often and all through the day it can regulate appetite and also um, it can it can increase people's appetite for people who've maybe lost their appetite again potentially due to um, re-establishment of circadian rhythms and also increased energy levels so we can know we can have a direct impact in these areas and it's these areas um, that potentially are sometimes overlooked when we give maybe some psychoeducation on exercise and depression um, a lot of time maybe the focus and i was sort of guilty of this as well maybe the focus um, of what we speak about is or the mood boost and the endorphin response but actually there's a lot of evidence suggesting it's these this direct impact on the autonomic symptoms that might be the key to the depression and exercise relationship so based um i guess some other mechanisms of action which don't necessarily fit into a specific category um, and what we have found in some of our research some of our qualitative research and others have found in their qualitative research exploring that, that have explored exercise on uh, depression in adults and children and young people are really these areas now the, the top one there normalization and social value I think this is a really key thing and so often overlooked when we think about exercise so firstly there's a normalization to it. Okay, someone engages in exercise, it's something normal, it's something that other people do. And that could be really sort of powerful for somebody experiencing depression who's maybe avoided a lot of activity and maybe feels like they're not doing the things that other people are doing. But more importantly than that, there is social value um, connected with exercise. Um, it's a, you know, it's a thing that we all wish we were doing more of. And it's a thing that we tend to feel guilty when we're not doing. And we tend to feel a bit envious or even um, annoyed or frustrated when people tell us that they're exercising. Um, and it's because there's value attached to it. We're sort of taught from an early age that it's a good thing to do to play outside and be active. So actually, if people with depression engage in exercise, there's something additional there. It's not just the impact on mood and the impact on autonom autonomic symptoms. It's the social value. It's the idea that they've got something to be proud of, something to talk about. And a lot of um, our research participants have reported that it actually gave them a sense of identity too. So a sense of being physically active, that was something they did and something they were. Yeah, they engaged in sports, they went on runs. Again, can be really, really important um, for somebody to develop who's maybe experiencing, especially chronic depression, where maybe that sense of identity is lost. Um, we know exercise is associated with a sense of mastery and self-efficacy. And again, these things can be sort of relatively um, depleted in depression. So, um, Mastery is a sense that somebody can sort of achieve a certain outcome and, and engage and, and achieve a certain skill level. And again, exercise gives that opportunity. And self-efficacy is somebody's belief that they can sort of achieve a certain, um, a certain, like I said, again, really a certain outcome and self-confidence in that. And again, exercise gives people an opportunity to do that. And linked with that is a sense of achievement. What an achievement to start exercising again and being physically active. Um, Body image, again, participants have reported that they perceive, that they perceive changes in their body image in a positive way. And interestingly, a lot of people sort of report this prior to any physical changes. Um, so we know it can potentially take up to six weeks for any sort of physical change to occur, um, maybe even beyond that, depending on the intensity of exercise. But people tend to report perceived changes in body image prior to that. And again, I guess we can all relate to that. We feel a bit better at ourselves, don't we? When we're exercising, we feel like we're maybe a little bit toned or we maybe feel like we're not noticing that sort of fat rolling around as much when we're walking or whatever. It can have an impact on how we perceive ourselves. And again, importantly, the qualitative research I'm referring to here is um, from depressed patients. And all these things together can have an impact on somebody's sort of sense of self-value uh, and self-worth and self-esteem. So we think there's quite a complex, um, I guess, a quite a complex interaction and relationship between all these factors and exercise. There's no one thing for sure, but we know it's all these potential things. And what some people will get out of exercise will differ from other people. Um, so, um, Patrick, do you want to just talk through some of 
the qualitative data from some of our research with young people. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Tim, for that. Um, so increasingly what you're finding when people are doing randomised controlled trials, and certainly when Tim and I have been doing randomised controlled trials, we've actually did um, uh, process and qualitative evaluations alongside the trials, because increasingly it's not enough just to say this works or it doesn't. Uh, we want to explore the mechanisms from the point of view of participants about why they think it may have worked for them. So this is uh, work for, um, that we've uh, done uh, with young people and I've done uh, work also with um, uh, women who are depression. And this just is uh, some of the themes that have come up when we have explored qualitatively why people appear to have a positive outcome from a trial which was looking at different intensity exercise levels. So the first thing of course is the sense of achievement. And that links back to what Tim was saying about mastery. Um, and that ties very, nice, very nicely into Albert Bandura's um, social uh, uh, model um, uh, because self-efficacy is a huge part of that Bandura model and a key part of um, why exercise increases self-efficacy is because it gives you a sense of achievement and actually you can start to get a sense of mastery of the exercise tasks. It's a very, very important part of boosting uh, self-efficacy in a sense. So uh, young people are studying think they really felt a major sense of achievement. And we know that when people are depressed, of course, that things like uh, being able to recognize uh, uh, your achievements is impaired somewhat. So for exercise to try and bring that about is quite an important outcome. Um, of course, the attention refocusing, uh, that ties into some of the stuff Tim was saying earlier about um, mindfulness, the mindfulness effect of, of exercising, and also some of the theories of exercising around it just simply as a distraction um, from some of the, 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 ba the, the bad things in your life, uh, some of the negative things in your life, actually in exercising. You have to concentrate, obviously, to get the best out of exercise, and there's nothing else going on while you're concentrating on the exercise. So what it's also doing is having a calming effect on you because your attention is being refocused, very energy. Of course, exercise gives you more energy, of course. Um, you're likely, oddly, to sleep much better if you've done uh, uh, exercise uh, uh, during the day. You feel energized, this young person feel very energized, um, less likely to want to just sit around and do nothing. And of course, sitting around and doing nothing is often when people report depression. They're sitting around and doing nothing. They feel a lack of energy. They feel a lack of volition to want to do other things. And actually, exercise gives you an, agenda, an energy rush um, as well. We know from various studies around exercise that people who do exercise feel that they then build much more motivation. And motivation is a key component of the, uh, a model I'm going to talk about a little later. Um, and so here's just a comment again from a young person who talked about what, why, why exercise increased their motivation. Uh, and, and there was also a surprising element to that young person when they found that their motivation was being increased because again, a lack of volition or motivation is a key component of depression, as you know. And of course, another uh, key component in depression is lower mood. And we know that from our session that exercise started to have a mood enhancing effect and quite possibly for many of the reasons Tim talked about, about the mechanisms of action, uh, although I'm going to talk a little bit about more about what we feel with the mechanisms of actions as well. Uh, so these are just a selection of quotes we got from uh, young people who had been involved in an exercise trial uh, with us when we were working at the University of Nottingham and that work is all published. You will find the references to that work if you wish to explore it further. Thank you, Tim, can you move on? Thank you. Um, just to sort of highlight in addition with this, like the this, these were young people in treatment in CAMS with moderate to severe depression. And these were also kids that didn't exercise. So we sort of took their exercise levels at the outset and the sort of average number of minutes of exercise per week was zero. So we were talking about a sort of highly depressed, sedentary set of young people. Um, and I guess that's just really important to consider that even though they weren't exercising before, didn't really want to exercise and had all the symptoms of depression, they still experienced these, these elements from taking part, which, um, which again, it's just, um, it, was, it was really rewarding to see, wasn't it? And um, mm. I yeah. love the quote at the end about the mood, of course, you know, especially the last part of that, like, I just felt a lot happier, but when I came home, I was just in a really good mood. And that's quite important and that's quite encouraging when, when people are saying things like that. 
uh, as an after effect. But we, we, we've seen that in others, but to have that expressed in that way is quite interesting and quite important, I think. Well, it's interesting because it's that sort of thing came up quite often. Mm -hmm. And actually, when people went on to speak about that afterwards, they sort of talked about, linked with that idea of social value, is that they said that they had something to talk about with their parents. They had something to talk about with their siblings and their mates, that they've done this thing. Yeah. Uh, that they'd they done, they'd just been to an exercise session and that they were getting better yeah. at it and they were doing something. They, they just didn't get home and run upstairs and be in the room on their own. They started to have discussions. They went mm. home and had to discussions about how good this exercise session was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, and in previous studies, we know that we've controlled for the effect of the social support element of exercising in groups. So we found that even when we controlled for social support, it's an important element in most things, that the uh, outcomes we got were, were the same. So it wasn't just the social support that was producing the outcome. Um, the outcome was appearing even when we controlled for uh, social support in our analysis. And that's quite important because often people who are critics of exercise say actually it's not the exercise per se it's the actual social support element because lots of people are exercising groups we have found that's not the case yeah okay right where am i okay so yeah. behavioral activation right so um we're going to talk now a bit about how you might incorporate uh, physical activity uh into quite meaningfully into behavioral activation for depression. And um, we've got a few slides sort of dedicated to this and we'd really like to get your views on it as well. So any questions, sort of pop them up and we can, um, we can talk them through at the same time. Um, so just, I guess just to preface this, um, Marie, Patrick and I are in the process of putting together um, a specific guide, which we'll talk briefly about at the end. And some of this information will be presented um, in that guide to clinicians and um, and to clients um, and we are looking at um, developing a number of sort of research projects around this as well but what I'm talking about now is based on our, um, our research to date and our sort of clinical experiences as well so when we're thinking about incorporating into BA, the first thing to consider is initial conversations about exercise with clients. And the first thing is about potentially to have them to sort of give that psychoeducation, knowing all the evidence linking exercise and depression and all the potential mechanisms. Um, it seems appropriate to give that psychoeducation alongside um, the rationale for BA, etc. And importantly, when we're giving that psychoeducation, it's as I sort of identified earlier, it's sort of going beyond talking about maybe endorphin boosts or mood boosts and talking about um, the potential to impact on some of the autonomic symptoms, the potential to impact more psychologically, for instance, um, alongside the potential for mood improvement and a sense of calmness and relaxation. Um, so there's a variety of things that somebody might get out of exercise and it's important at the outset when we talk about it that we don't set um, I guess just put all our eggs in one basket or suggest that they will get all of these things. It might be that somebody just gets one. Um, so yeah, that's really important to consider when we're giving that psychoeducation at the outset. And again, potentially if this is already coming up within your, when you're giving your rationale for um, routine regulation in BA, link it to Zeitgeibers, um, those sort of time givers in the day, if you like, to build the rationale so that it can improve um, melatonin production or it can bring forward melatonin production to improve um, somebody's sleep um, and allow somebody to start becoming sleepy earlier in the evening if that was an issue for somebody and the potential to access to light in the day to potentially again aid sleep again to reset those circadian rhythms that can be part of the psychoeducation potentially can be quite appealing for somebody to start engaging in it really important here though and I guess I think this is maybe um, some of the downsides to previous work in this area around physical activity and mental health is that actually we're quite quite explicit here that you just shouldn't make the focus on physical health recommendations um, because we all know that stuff we all know we should be exercising because it's good for heart disease and it's good for various cancers and it's good for all a whole host of physical health problems we all know it but we still don't necessarily all do it so Actually, we just need to make it clear that when we're talking about this in relation to BA, we're not 
talking about it in relation to weight loss, fitness or physical health. The purpose is potentially to regulate routine, as we've talked about, or potentially to give um, uh, somebody the ability to focus their attention away from um, distracting symptoms um, or negative automatic thoughts, or to give someone the opportunity to um, take control over things and potentially improve their mood if that's what they get out of exercise. But it's not about weight loss, fitness or physical health. Not at the outset. If somebody, and you, maybe your values exercise that you might do as part of BA, does identify some of those things as important, then yes, potentially you could make it as part of that. But at the outset, we make it about mental health and well-being and routine regulation, not physical health. And I guess that's sort of, I've put there the sort of chief medical officer's physical activity guidelines, because we know that for physical health, actually what you potentially need is maybe out of reach for people with, especially with moderate to severe depression, um, who are sort of very sedentary at the outset of treatment. It's not really um, appropriate to be talking about this level of activity, two and a half hours a week of moderate intensity activity, or an hour and 15 minutes of vigorous activity. This might be completely unappealing and is likely if somebody's not into exercise or maybe didn't do it before and doesn't necessarily value it so much at the outset, it's just going to be shut down. It's not going to be something of interest. It's not going to be seen as doable. So we need to avoid this idea it's about physical health. It might come become that later for somebody, but at the outset, routine regulation, mental health and well-being is the focus. Um, so, as sort of mentioned, I would say at the start, it's about trying to incorporate, after you've given some psychoeducation, try and incorporate maybe exercise or physical activity as part of that routine regulation alongside sort of deciding when some, agreeing with the person about when they might go to bed or when they might eat. Actually, maybe agreeing potentially quite um, in quite a routine way how they might consistently engage in some physical activity. Now, this really is only if the person's sort of interested or willing to engage in it. Obviously, don't force it, okay? Because again, we don't want to make this unappealing um, or unattractive in any way. So apologies if you can hear a baby crying. That's uh, one, of, that's <laughs> one of the difficulties of working from home. Um, so yeah, but it's really important potentially to incorporate as part of routine regulation, again, to build that natural drive to sleep and to eat and to and start to increase those energy levels. It can really sort of potentially um, supercharge, if you like, some of that stuff that BA is already doing. But if somebody's not interested and not willing and maybe never exercise, and it's not necessarily considered an avoided activity, um, again, maybe be mindful of that at the outset. We don't want to force this because people just won't do it and it'll sort of negate the whole BA process really. So keep in mind also in terms of, you know, the, the process of BA, people need to be very careful in terms of the energy reserves. Um, so obviously exercise is literally using lots of energy and sort of part of it. So we need to be very mindful um, that people don't overdo it. So that 50% um, guidance is really important here but also there's a very sort of significant potential for sort of boom bust as well some people will get a high from it some people will get um, a sense of energy or calmness or clarity or improved concentration or whatever it might be that they get but they might get it and they might get it quite powerfully if they've really been very sedentary for a long time and they engage in it in a um in a maybe quite low intense way so they're not sort of burning themselves out so we do need to be mindful that they stick to the plan or stick to the um to the sort of routine regulation plan that you'd set out to avoid that boom bust um potential now when um someone's not sort of maybe willing or able or interested in engaging in specific period of exercise so like maybe you know specifically going for a walk or a run or a swim or something like that especially the outset of treatment, that's very likely that people won't be interested in doing that sort of stuff. I guess it's about exploring with the client how to engage in exercise, what we call incidental activity. So um, I guess like activity that could be considered um, like done in small amounts throughout the day. So sort of just generally adapting somebody's sort of um, activities, if you like, to become a little bit more physically active. And again, the same process will take place. It will still potentially be using energy to gain energy, still potentially be engaging in activity that allows light to come into the retina if it's done outside, and um, still gaining that sense of achievement from doing something active as opposed to inactive. 
So some examples like going for a short walk, et cetera, or, um, potentially, but maybe instead of taking the car, for instance, or using the stairs, getting off a bus early, maybe doing something active while watching television, but just starting to build in activity or physical activity could be quite useful here, especially if somebody's not willing or able to engage in specific exercise or physical activity at the outset. So when physical activity is maybe uh, considered or identified as an avoided activity, something that maybe somebody did do and maybe con consider getting back to, um, Obviously, as you would do with any other activity, it's about identifying barriers, but I guess it's really exploring in, in quite a lot of detail here, quite specifically, perhaps above and beyond some of the other activities about how they, some of those um, barriers can be addressed, especially considering the client's NATS and autonomic symptoms, um, which will be major, major barriers to getting back to maybe the physical activity or exercise that they might have done previously. So really spending a lot of time, as much as you can in the confines of, of your role, um, focusing on this, because what we know is, as I said from the outset, there's a lot of evidence linking just physical activity and exercise on its own to depression reduction. So actually it's potentially time well served to focus in on how you can overcome some of these specific barriers to exercise and physical activity, maybe over and above some of the other activities. For a lot of some people, physical activity or exercise is not going to be of interest, even after the psychoeducation and all that sort of stuff. Potentially it won't be of interest. Maybe they never did it, never sort of valued it. That doesn't mean it maybe it's sort of a lost cause. So I would say, and what I tend to do in my practice, is having done a values exercise with someone, it might be that I can actually explicitly myself or Socratically, depending on time, um, link somebody's actual values that they've already established with physical activity. Maybe for instance, somebody has values around being outdoors or being with other people or doing things that are productive or looking after themselves. These things could be linked by you um, to exercise or physical activity. It might be another route into engaging somebody or getting someone to agree to at least test it out in some way. So if the client did used to engage in physical activity um, or exercise and, you're, and it's an avoided activity now, it may be considered as a pleasurable activity. Um, potentially that's how it was, it used to be engaged in. But again, this needs to be checked out with the, um, with the client. Um, Patrick, I think this is, is it your, is your sound on? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, sorry, hold on. Was... Sorry. Um, so, but check this out, because actually for some people, so literally for a client I'm working with at the moment, she actually doesn't consider exercise pleasurable at all, but she does notice that it has quite a strong impact on her energy levels, etc. So she has sort of considered it as a routine activity. Um, so just check this out with people. Don't sort of make an assumption about where it fits. Um, but ideally you would want to maybe move move in a general direction or the client to move in a general direction, perhaps post-treatment even, that exercise moves more towards the sort of pleasurable category. Um, and again, that might be about trying different things because we know if people enjoy exercise and get something from it, a sense of fun or enjoyment, they're more likely to continue doing it. But also consider the different types of physical activity. So we can sort of think about it as terms of functional physical activity. So it's like non-exercise based. If we think about exercise as a, a subtype of physical activity whereby we're wanting to increase fitness and increase heart rate, etc. Functional physical activity is maybe something that has a separate function but is nonetheless physically active. And some examples here are things like gardening or building something or photography outside, etc. And again, these can be really important things, but it's good to label them potentially as physically active when you're working with a client, just so that it's sort of upfront and explicit that what they're doing is active here and might then garner some of the benefits that we've talked about. And the other type, I guess what we're talking about here is specific exercise tasks. Yeah, so when it is about actually doing something specifically for the, for the purpose of exercising. Um, and when we think about that, it really can be anything. That's really important. So, um, so a nice guidance for um, management of depression in adults currently states for mild to moderate depression that people should be encouraged to exercise, let me get this right, uh, grew in groups three times a week for 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 about an hour um, for at least for around 14 weeks. Now, 
for many reasons, that's potentially not realistic. They might not have the confidence to go to a group. Um, they might not have the money because who's running that? I mean, potentially there's some very good um, specific examples like um, Janine's work, for instance, but how common is that throughout different areas? Um, and actually that can seem quite overwhelming three times a week for an hour. So actually we need to be very, very um, uh, idiosyncratic, I guess, when we talk about this with with clients. So yes, there's evidence to suggest aerobic or resistance exercise is useful. There's evidence for both. There's evidence for group-based exercise potentially as additional things that they, people might get from it. Um, but there's evidence for individual-based exercise on depression reduction. But what we do want to see if someone is interested and wants to engage in exercise is that it works better if it's regular. Yeah, so not sort of like once a month. So really established within that BA diary, we want it to be regular. But we do need, very importantly, as I mentioned earlier, to stick to um, the, the guidelines of BA, not going beyond 50% of energy levels, not sort of moving away from the plans, just sticking to what was planned. Really, really important. But importantly also, it needs to be enjoyable in some way, or at least have the potential to be enjoyable. Um, and again, that can be quite an important discussion with somebody. Um, and our research has found that actually, despite um, th there's a massive variation in the research evidence base in terms of what intensity someone should exercise at to gain depression um, symptom reduction. So we, our research focused on people exercising at their own preferred intensity, whatever they wanted to do. And actually we found all those quotes, for instance, that we showed earlier with the young people, they all came from preferred self-selected intensity exercise. So not telling people to exercise at a certain amount. And actually what we did find is most people, when we asked them, tended to exercise at low to moderate intensity exercise. And there is a lot of research to show that the effect on energy can actually be more pronounced with low intensity exercise as opposed to moderate and high, especially in relation to high intensity exercise, which can have um, the opposite effect. But again, a nice little sort of thing here to remember is local, enjoyable and practical. Yeah, so it just needs to be practical. Whatever someone wants to do, if they are wanting to engage in specific exercise tasks, so I'm not necessarily talking here about functional physical activity or incidental activity. I'm on about specific exercise tasks. It needs to be something that someone can do regularly. It needs to be something that potentially is enjoyable and, has, and is practical. Okay, so some considerations. Um, you know, even if the client did do something specifically before and wants to get back to it, encourage them to consider a variety of different exercises or physical activities. Um, it's an opportunity to test new things out. And especially if there's maybe some limitations now for the client that might not be able to do the things they used to do. Really important to consider, maybe based on the person's values, a variety of different approaches. You know, I've suggested there before that actually people should you know, there's research, our research showing that exercise at preferred intensity is effective, but it might be in the first instance that you encourage clients to exercise at low intensity, whatever they do, even incidental activity. Um, and again, because there actually is some evidence to show it has increased benefits over higher intensities, but most importantly, we don't want to put people off. We don't want to, um, we want people to have the best chance to get some of those um, autonomic symptom relief um, and the mood mood boost like there's going to be nothing worse if someone sort of goes out for a for a run or goes out for a long walk and gets absolutely shattered halfway through and just can't finish it that's going to be that's going to have a huge impact and probably potentially lead someone not to carry on doing it so we really want to encourage low intensity not a focus on duration just to focus on energy um, energy reserves at the outset and again, when you're reviewing this, maybe when you're reviewing the diary in BA, focus specifically on changes in mood, attention, and very specifically autonomic symptoms. Focus in on those when you're reviewing the diary. Because if someone has gone out of the way to do some exercise, that's a huge achievement for someone with depression. And does, I believe, warrant some specific attention when reviewing the diary. But getting someone to focus on what did they notice in these areas keeping in mind some of the mechanisms that we've talked about there you might actually directly ask about some of those things but again when you are reviewing this be mindful that some of the changes like sleep and appetite they might not be linked by the client to physical activity because there'll be a delay in those things 
someone's not just going to be feel sleepy after exercise and they might notice after a, a period of time regularly exercising that their sleep's improved or that their appetites become more regulated so keep that in mind when reviewing again if someone's starting to engage in regular activity whether it's um, specific exercise tasks as part of uh, routine regulation or increased incidental activity get the client to start tracking sleep duration and quality following days they've engaged in exercise or across the week again that could be really important for somebody's motivation to continue now research has shown large research study that i'm sorry i don't have the reference for there but i will give that to marie to give to you has shown that for moderate depression, that tobacco use, excessive alcohol, and like, inflexible work conditions are essentially some of the biggest predictors to non-exercise or to non-adherence to exercise for people with depression. Uh, and I guess it makes sense to some degree. If someone's drinking and, and smokes a lot, it's going to be potentially be harder and if flexible at work, less opportunity. So these elements, obviously, you potentially capture this information in your assessment, but it's worth considering that we need to take a very individual approach to this. And actually, maybe someone who is smoking a lot and drinking quite a bit, et cetera, and maybe is physically um, potentially quite hindered in engaging in exercise, it might be that you consider encouraging incidental activity, so sort of general increase in activity throughout the day rather than focusing on repeated exercise tasks, for instance. Um, and although we've got that evidence suggesting exercise earlier in the day might have a better effect on um, psychadian rhythm realignment actually for some people if works rigid etc they might have to do it in the evening so again just be mindful about the type of information psychoeducation that you are going to deliver um, because you know potentially it might just be about moderating how much exercise they do or what intense they do and trying to push it as early as possible in the evening but again we don't want to put people off or, or take away that sort of option for people Okay, over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Tim. So we've talked a lot about evidence-based approaches to try and bring about behaviour change. And one of the commonly used models now is the COMBI model, which you're familiar with, and I believe it's in your, your guidelines as well. Um, this has come from a lot of work that's been done at the University of College of London. <clears throat> and it's been widely applicable to a huge range of activities for which we're trying to affect uh, behaviour change. This model is based on the principle that when you're using psychological interventions, those interventions that are underpinned by sound theory tend to have more effect than those that are not, in a sense. So this is just a diagrammatic representation of the COMBI model and the three key components of, not surprisingly, a capability or capacity, the capability capacity of someone to actually engage in the behaviour. Um, the motivation that they have to uh, uh, engage in the behaviour and of course the opportunity, uh, usually an infrastructure opportunity that allows them to engage in the behaviour. And in the presence of these three things then we're more likely to see the, the behaviour. So interventions that address these three things are more likely to, to see the behaviour. Uh, not so interestingly, just yesterday I was involved in a discussion at work in how we could use the COMBI model and we've developed a combi model for improving students' compliance with the uh, hand, head, uh, hand uh, face and space attempt to try and get them to comply with um, safety guidelines around uh, COVID-19. And that was quite interesting. We've developed a script uh, for colleagues in the university to say, if students are not complying, these are what might help the compliance of students. So, but the common model has also been applied to um, exercise uptake and enhancements. And I want to give you an example uh, uh, of that common model in practice, uh, where uh, we might, you as a PWP might use it, the interventions that you may use to actually within the combi model to improve uh, exercise uptake. Tim, please. Oh, sorry. I need you to move the slide. Technology wasn't very practiced. There we go. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. So again, this is um, the evidence-based BCT. So within the whole COMBI model, which is part of an overall theoretical domains framework for trying to enhance behaviour change, uh, uh, the key part of that is about 93 behaviour change taxonomies or techniques for improving the behaviour, uh, the desired behaviour of interest. So here's uh, uh, an example of how you could use BCTs. These are the four key BCTs that have been used for improving physical activity. There hasn't been yet 
directly applied to physical activity for depression. Tim and I have talked about developing uh, BCTs for depression. These have been used for people uh, who have physical health issues, which, uh, as well as people who have um, uh, uh, mental health issues associated with living with a long-term condition. So the first thing which you'll be familiar with, of course, is goal setting. So a very key BCT uh, for enhancing most behaviours. The second one is feedback and outcome. Uh, the third one is graded tasks. And the fourth one is what we call adding objects. So examples of adding objects might be the use of speedometers. So anything that might uh, uh, give the feedback or help people uh, to show the improvements that, that, that they're making. And this work um, comes from a very, very good uh, systematic review of the literature looking at um, uh, uh, behaviour change taxonomies um, uh, and the use of exercise to improve um, uh, uh, both physical health as well as the mental health aspects of um, people uh, living with long-term conditions. Uh, so these are, I think, very helpful for PWPs to use because very easy to use. It would be part of a lot of PWP interventions for other things anyway, and you should be well familiar. So if you're using these, these these uh, uh, four components, uh, BCTs, which are part of the COMBI model, then you've got very good evidence-based argument for these interventions, and you'll be familiar with these, these interventions anyway for other conditions. Uh, so there you go, that's a very good uh, advancement of the evidence base for uh, behaviour change, because as we know, behaviour change is one of the biggest challenges uh, in most aspects of society, getting people to do things that we need them to do or we would desire them to do or they in themselves wish to do in order to improve either the health and well-being or any aspect of their behaviour. Okay, so um, we're sort of coming to the end now, so hopefully we'll have a few minutes for Q&A afterwards. Um, but very briefly, um, as many of you are probably aware, there is already a sort of behavioural activation and physical activity guide in existence. Um, which obviously can be used and maybe you are, you are using. Um, but just sort of, um, I guess just to be mindful that actually this, this protocol um, does have sort of relatively limited evidence underpinning it. So there's no research, there's no definitive trial tests and effectiveness. The, the, the feasibility study that it's based on had relatively small sample size and actually there wasn't any real sort of evidence of protocol adherence. We don't really know what people did or didn't do necessarily. Um, and also the, the, the physical activity and, and BA components aren't necessarily well integrated as such. It sort of tends to be do BA and then P, the physical activity stuff sort of comes afterwards to some degree, which potentially could work for some people. But I guess what we're sort of promoting here is a bit more of an integrated approach right at the outset establishing physical activities, potentially routine regulation, etc. And also within it, there's a quite a strong focus on uh, clients wearing pedometers, but um, potentially that, again, there's no real um, qualitative evidence underpinning people's experiences of that, but um, that could be quite counterproductive people with depression, sort of having a, a sort of count of what they're doing and how often they're doing it. For some people that might be useful, but for quite a lot of people that potentially could be setting people up to fail and maybe setting, maybe again, moving the sort of um, the focus, if you like, more towards physical health. And, and the focus in this guide tends to be on about improving and doing more. And that's not necessarily what we want to be doing here. Actually, the focus should be on doing something enjoyable and seeing what you get from it and going from there, not focusing as all exercise um, approaches tend to be in relation to physical health about you know, getting fitter and moving forward and building more time and et cetera. That can be useful if the person wants to, but it shouldn't be the priority um, within, the, within the guide from our perspective anyway. But nonetheless, it's not to say, um, obviously that's not useful. I, I think it's potentially useful because it's engaging somebody in physical activity for sure, but just be mindful of those things. And I guess in relation to that, we are sort of developing our own guide um, and based on some of the information presented today alongside um, obviously more information with specific guidance and session by session guidance etc so we're in the process of developing that at the moment and we are going to also be in the process of developing um, sort of funding applications for large-scale randomized controlled trials to test it out um, sort of to improve that evidence base um, so yeah so look, sort of look out for that and I guess Marie might be able to tell you a bit more about that because she's at this sort of thing um but yeah that's uh, so yeah that's coming at some point in the near future 
Uh, and that's that's it. That's the end of our talk. Thank you. So I think we can take questions now, can we? Maria, is there questions? Thank you for your attention, everyone. Um, that was really, really helpful. Um, there's a couple of questions. Um, it would be good to answer in the chat. Let me just scroll back through. Um, Lewis asked a question that I now can't find. Uh, that, that can you turn the volume down a little bit, please? Back, can you turn the volume down a little bit, please, on the television? Um, right, there's Lewis's question. Lewis, could you just... I can't find a question in the amount of chat. Sorry, I did copy it, but it wouldn't paint. Ah, there we go. Lewis says he's curious whether anyone has looked into how intense exercise also means we have to learn to be more comfortable with discomfort and if anything probably came out in the qualitative around that um, or otherwise and um, it means that you do things even when you don't feel like doing it which can turbo, turbo boost BA so yeah is there anything about um, sitting with discomfort? I think that's one of the one of the mechanisms underpinning how exercise might be helpful with anxiety specifically so sitting mm -hmm. with some of that those sort of feared symptoms it can really sort of um, boost that sort of process in relation to um maybe exposure exercises but um in terms of depression yes i mean it's not necessarily something that's come up in our qualitative research um but it makes sense doesn't it that somebody could sit with um sort of feeling uncomfortable um and sort of work through that um yeah patrick do you want to add anything to that yeah so if it's so this is talks back to, again to what we have been exploring with the preferred intensity uh, as opposed to the pres pres prescribed intensity. Uh, people are less likely to feel that if they know that they can safely exercise at a preferred intensity and you're not putting pressure on them to increase the move to the prescribed intensity. Uh, so there's less likelihood of that discomfort emerging because once in our studies uh, uh, when we uh, said to people okay exercise and when you feel you're getting to a really comfortable level then you stay. So you stay at that level and you continue to exercise at that level. So that reduces the impact, the, the possibility of people starting to feel really uncomfortable with that. Um, and they'll still generate the sufficient uh, mental health and well-being outcomes, the depression outcomes, the anxiety, positive anxiety outcomes. So that's one way of dealing with that. Uh, so I was quite interested in the comment in the chat about the exercise as punishment that somebody forgot their PE kit at school and they were t had to stay behind and, and then do uh, 10 runs around the field. And that's what I would call a paradoxical intervention in some sense here. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I've been, uh, we're doing some work right now with high school teachers about trying to move away from punishment as the approach to try and change the behaviour and turn punishment into something very beneficial. So I, I quite like the idea of exercise for, uh, for that method if they're running around the, the field and, uh, and they're not being overwhelmed by it, then it's actually going to boost their mood, interestingly. But psychologically, if it's just seen as a, an element of punishment. So I'd love to reframe that. We've been doing that with high school kids, uh, reframe the messaging around um, uh, uh, why you're imposing these interventions for uh, fra uh, fra uh, infractions or, or, or of behaviour, uh, essentially. Um, so, so I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a real paradoxical intervention. But it, I think also with what, that, what, what was said there, I think it, like with most things, the problem is that people tend to leave it to the feel like it to exercise when actually the most benefit would gained when some would be gained when somebody really doesn't feel like doing it. So actually, exactly, and also the put it in, as we said, into, into their schedule. So I would say in, that, in those early weeks of BA, when somebody starts to learn that, if you can incorporate exercise at that point again i think it's a really nice uh, phrase potentially that potentially would turbo boost it because it yeah. really would be quite explicit hopefully if someone engages in it again not sort of using too much energy and not mm -hmm. um overwhelming themselves it could really be quite pronounced that in that moment they didn't want to do it everything in their body and mind told them not to do it they did it anyway what did they get from it yeah it could be really really profound for yeah. people 
Great, okay. folks. I'm going to have to parish you out uh, now because now, I'll Thank have to take a, a meeting. But I just, uh, but please carry on the discussion. Uh, I just want to say it's been great being able to share this with you and thanks for all your comments on the chat. And I also noticed that my former colleague, Helen Moyer, is actually on the discussion as well. So Helen, how lovely to hear from you and not quite seeing you, of course, but uh, it's great to, to see you uh, involved. Uh, fond memories of our time working together at Nottingham. Uh, anyway, so uh, have a, yeah, there's Helen Wiffen. Uh, so, oh, so lovely to see you, Helen, uh, again. Yeah, likewise. So, okay, so I hope to parish you in later when Melissa gives her talk. So thanks again for all your attention this morning and catch you up later, both of you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you, Patrick. Tim and James has asked a question. When talking about increased energy after low and moderate exercise, how long are those gains sustained for immediately post-exercise? You know, is it energised for the day, the next day? And I kind of said it probably varies in terms of what they do the next day, whether they do too much and boom bust, whether they do punishing activities. Um, but is there anything more you can... No, and this is going to sound like a cop-out, but it's extremely individual. Mm. Like, it's extremely individual. It's based on somebody's baseline physical fitness. It's based on... Um, it's based on sort of psychologically what the person feels they got out of it. Like there's a lot going on in terms of alongside the physiological sort of increase sort of oxygen and blood flow and mitochondrial change, etc. There's a lot going on. Like energy levels are somewhat sort of subjective as well. So I would say it's not going to be the same for any one person. And again, it'd be about exploring that with them. Like what did they get out of it? What did they notice? And then you might be able to start building their schedule around them rather than assuming it would be a certain thing. So I would say just start very low at the start, at the outset, in terms of how much and how often, um, because some people will find it that it's, it's tiring, even if they do limit it to 50% of their energy reserves. So again, just being very sort of individualistic with, with that element of it, I would say. Um, I would say that's the best approach rather than sort of broad brush, maybe suggesting that it would last for a certain amount of time. Um, and again, just again, some people might not notice an energy boost after exercise. Some people might just notice that they feel quite tired, but nicely tired and relaxed. So again, it's that whole point at the start when we talk about psychoeducation, we suggest that they, these are the potential things that might come from it, but we recognize that it's going to be very individual, depending on a lot of different factors. Um, yeah. You know, bear in mind that, you know, in the context of depression and the negative reinforcement, you know, they, they've avoided activities to, to reduce their negative cognitions to, and reduce the impact of their symptoms. So initially, in the initial phase of BA treatment, you are going to see as the cycle reverses more thoughts, potentially more tiredness. And it's really important to prep them for that and prep trainees that that happens so they don't panic and throw the treatment out thinking it's not working or think they need to add in um, additional elements when they don't. Um, so I'm just conscious of time though, and I'd like to say welcome to Melissa who's joined us from um, um, America. I can't, I can't think now because my head's trying to do a million things. From Penn over in um, Pennsylvania, obviously. I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. Um, who's going to do our IBS talk? And again, in the IBS protocol, there's stuff on exercise as well, which is really interesting in terms of how that works and specific yoga that can help with the gut. So that'll be really interesting. But I'm really conscious about your lunch. So it's 12 o'clock. So any questions we haven't answered, me and Tim will just hang around and answer in the chat. Tim, there's another one for you. Um, and otherwise, we will see you at half past. So thanks, everybody. If you want to ask any more questions, throw them in and we'll get them answered. But other than that, see you after lunch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.